royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that we may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once we were alienated from God and were enemies in our minds because of our evil behavior, but now he has reconciled us by Christ's physical body through death to present us holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. For we were once darkness, but now we are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. tells us 
Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. I will bow down and I will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. tells us, sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing to him a psalm of praise. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory.
Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we've come into your presence on this beautiful day, Lord, we just want to praise you. We want to adore you. Lord, we acknowledge you as the sovereign of our lives, as the sovereign of our country, of the world, of the entire universe. God, you are our hope for eternity. We want to praise you for calling us friends. And Lord, we want to praise you and thank you for adopting us as your children into your greater family. Lord, you truly are the king of the universe and the king of our hearts. But Father, we have to confess to you that we are a people that turns away. We place our eyes on the things and the people of this world for aid. We place our hope in things that we should not. So forgive us, Lord, for not keeping our eyes on you. And forgive us when we act unfaithfully. Father, we thank you for our lives that you've given to us on the earth for a brief time. Father, thank you for your provision, for your health, your protection. Thank you, God, for the freedom that we can choose to be free of sin because of what Jesus has done for us. Father, thank you for the salvation and eternal life that you promise us that we look forward to and that hope of eternal glory. Father, in our congregation, in our family, we have brothers and sisters who need a touch from you, a healing touch, a word of encouragement from friends, or even your word, the Bible. Father, we pray for our country as well, that we might, as a country, turn from our wicked ways and, and focus on you and return to you. Lord, I want to thank you for our pastors here in Sydney, in all the churches, but especially for Pastor Doug and for Pastor Kyle. I pray that you would bless Pastor Kyle's words to us this morning as he speaks to us about wisdom. So, Lord, we just thank you now that we can come together to worship and praise you. We pray that you would receive our, our offerings, whether our, our words or our finances, Lord, that you've blessed us with. God, we thank you, and we pray these things now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. All right, good morning again, everybody. The elders thought it would be wise uh, to kind of update you with the pastor youth pastor search that, that has been going on here. So we have been meeting pretty much weekly ever, ever since January, looking, receiving resumes, we've gone through a lot of those, giving out applications, uh, calling on all the candidates. I've, I've personally called all of them, and, and then we've set up Zoom. You, you, by all, you guys probably all know what that is now, nowadays, but we've Zoomed with a, many of these candidates, and yeah, things are, things are happening. We, we, uh, have probably four guys, and they're probably watching right now <laughs> uh, as they're thinking about looking at us, uh, as they should be. And so anyway, um, things are happening is, is, what, is what I'm trying to get across. And so please continue to be praying for this special person. Uh, I probably more than most know how vitally important uh, having a youth pastor, a specific person in our community designated to, to look after the spiritual well-being of, of seventh graders to 12th graders, all that change, all the, you know, the, the, the thinking and, and spiritual questions that, that they have going on in their lives, that person is, is key to just speaking to not only them, but, you know, parents walking with them and, and everything. So just, just you know, quick update. We're, we're, we're still looking. We're, we're still, um, again, processing and, and really praying for that person. We, we, we're hopeful. I'm very hopeful that maybe one of the four that we're, we're looking at currently 
is our guy, you know? And so just continue to be praying. Um, also, ministry's still happening, right? Like it's June, and, and we, every year, we have summer activities, and thank the Lord that Jack and Kayla Borcherding, I don't see them here this morning, but they have stepped up and, and, and graciously kind of thrown their hat in the ring, along with all the rest of my amazing youth sponsors. They, they, they want to take this summer, while, while we're in limbo with a, not having a youth pastor, they want to take it and, and do some events and that are in your bulletin, and maybe you don't know Jack and Kayla yet, and, and maybe the uh, the youth don't either, not amazingly anyway, they, they do know of them, but they, Jack and Kayla, made a little video uh, that we're going to get out to on social media and all that, but we're going to show it here as well, and so if we could cue that up. Hi, I'm Jack. Hi, I'm Jack. Kayla. And we're helping out with youth group this summer. Yeah, we have a lot of stuff planned. The first thing is a water fun night at the park, um, June 23rd at 6 p.m. So if you have like water squirters, you can bring those. We'll be doing games, slip and slide. We'll have um, ice pops. So get ready yeah. to have some fun. Yeah. Invite your friends yep. and don't forget the time and the place, right? Yeah, so Wednesday, June 23rd at 6 p.m. at the park. We can't yeah. wait to meet you guys. Yeah, and it'll be awesome. So see ya. yeah, bring your friends. We're going to sing our new song again. So Graves in the Gardens is one we've been singing the last couple of weeks. And uh, um, Psalm 86 tells us, Lord, you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. Such powerful words there, and I, we all just really like this song. So sing along, please. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that they are never enough. And you came along and put me together. And every desire is now set. Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you Love, there's nothing Nothing is better than you I'm not afraid To show you Who 
for coming. Thank you for tuning in. All right. Hey, did we make it to Gold Rush Days, anybody? Anybody do that? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's pretty fun. Okay. <laughs> All right. So my older brother, Adam, is into fly fishing. Uh, he's 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 really into fly fishing, and it sounds fun. Sounds expensive, but it does sound fun. And he got he got my mother into it. And mom, if you're watching, hello. Um, but in in hearing about it, and in, in hearing them talk about it, it doesn't. It's not that hard. That's what they tell me. Anyway, I've I've never done it. But and yes, you have to have the right gear, and you have to have the right technique, and all that. But what what they tell me is once the guides or the teachers tell you how to read the river it's it's really not that hard you're it's not you're not guessing where the fish are you know where the fish are you you know where they where they are and where they're not and it's all in again how to read the river how to understand the river and life life is hard that's, that's one of the first lessons we learn. Now, we often forget that lesson, and we assume that everything's just going to be easy, or at least I do. I, I assume that. Uh, and, and, but in the Bible, we're, we're given four books in the Bible known as the wisdom literature, okay? Job, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, and, and Proverbs. Now, I, I just want to preach really out of, out of three. The Song of Songs, I, guys, I just need more time <laughs> being a pastor before I preach that book. But maybe Doug, maybe, no, no, okay. Uh, anyway, but I want us to, in our next sermon series here, I want us to look at those three books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And it's interesting with those books because they, at first glance, they don't seem to fit in, in the storyline of the Bible. All right? The, the main storyline is, is God made everything, seen and unseen. He made humans in his image, male and female, made in the Im image of God, and commissioned them to be fruitful, multi multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it, reign with God. But they failed at that. And then Genesis 12 comes, Abraham, nation of Israel comes, and, and Israel is supposed to be that light to the other nations, showing them what God is really like. They were supposed to be set apart, holy, different. And they fail at that. I mean, they're, they're chasing after other gods. They don't fear God. They don't obey God. And it's, it's, it's pretty hopeless until Jesus comes. And Jesus shows us how to live, shows us what God is really like. 
lives for us, dies for us, is that righteous intercessor bringing us back to that right relationship with God that we had in the garden. So, but again, but then right in the middle of your Bibles, we have Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and, and Job. And they seem out of place. And they're dealing with, they're super practical. I mean, they are dealing with how to read the river, right? How to live well in this world. Um, they're, they're dealing with wisdom. How, what does it mean to fear the Lord? They're dealing with the problem of evil. But they do come back to Genesis 1 through 3, chapters 1 through 3, believe it or not. I once heard a theologian say that the Bible is like a mansion. And at the, you open up the first door, and in the first door, there's, there's all these keys to other doors. And then, then when you unlock this door, there's a key that unlocks that door. And it just, it, it, it all, though, can, can come back to the found, what is foundationally happening, especially in Genesis chapters 1 through 12, but especially Genesis 1 through 3. There's so much things happening there. And Lord willing, we're going to unpack all that. So again, I want to start a new series in July looking at, at Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job and asking ourselves, what kind of world are we living in? Really? And how do we live well in that world? Because again, we've just finished up uh, looking at God's character out of, out of Exodus 34, what God is really like. And now, again, I just want us to learn how to read the river, how to do it wisely. What, what does that look like? And in order for us to do that, we have to look at Solomon's story. And in order to look at Solomon's story, we have to look at Genesis 1 and 2. So, buckle up here, okay? So, Genesis 1 and 2. Again, God is the creator and provider of, for all knowledge of what good is and what bad is. Seven times in Genesis 1, God tells us, well, he makes things, and then he, he declares them good. God, God makes the, the light and says it's good, and the, and the stars and the land, and it's good, and it's good, and the animals, and it's good. Seven times he says that in chapter 1. And God is the first one in the story to tell us what is not good. A lonely human in the garden is not good. Low tov, not good. So God does something amazing. He takes Adam, whom he fashioned out of the dirt, and he, he tells him to, to name the animals. Right? So, so this is interesting because God is letting Adam in on what he's been doing up until that point. God was was ordering and naming things and ordering things. And now God delegates. He's a, he's a good leader. He delegates Adam. Hey, you do that. You go to the animals and see if you can find a suitable helper. And, God, or, and Adam does that. And at the end, there is no suitable helper to be found. Dogs are great, but they just don't get it. And so, so, God causes Adam to go into a deep sleep and then takes from the side of Adam and makes a woman. God splits the man and makes a woman, and, and God makes a suitable helper. Now, now help, that word help, it, it, it's a fine translation. It's azer in, in the Hebrew word, but in English, it just doesn't pack the same punch because it kind of gets us to like assistant realm, as assistant land. And the only other character in the Bible that's, that's called a help is in Psalm 121, David says this, and I think I've got the words here. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my azer, where does my help come from? My azer, my help comes from from the Lord, the maker 
of heavens and earth. See, Azer means to do for someone what they cannot do by themselves. They, David couldn't do it without God. And Eve is the essential other to Adam. She's different than him, but a, a human alone cannot, fundamentally, cannot do what God called humanity to do, to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, reign with God. Okay, so, so she is the essential other. And so here's where I want us to remember Adam and Eve before the fall. Okay, God, so I, I love Genesis 2. Because I, I picture a, a wedding. I, I actually do. Uh, imagine the, the, the father of the bride walking Eve to Adam. That's what's, ha that's, that's what's happening here. The, in, in verse 23 of chapter 2, the man said, when he sees Eve, the first bit of Hebrew poetry, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of a man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So again, Adam, so it was one, then it was two, now it's one again. It's beautiful. And then verse 25 is key. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. There's no, it's Adam and Eve and God in the garden. And there's, there's no shame. There's no evil. There's no sin. They were together. And, and it's implied that God would teach them and show them what is good and what, not, what is not good. He's the only one that knows, right? And, and, he, and he says, you can eat whatever fruit of any of the tree, but don't touch these two trees. The knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. You must not eat of it or you will surely die. But I, I want, and, and Adam and Eve were supposed to trust him and, 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 and just follow him, right? So I want us to have that, all of that, in our heads as we look at Solomon and his beginnings. In, in 1 Kings 2, 1 through, through 4, we read this. Uh, when, when David's time to draw near, or time, when David's time to die drew near, he charged his son Solomon saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong, be courageous, and keep the charge of the Lord your God walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies as it is written in the, in the law of Moses. Why? So that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Then the Lord will establish his word that he spoke concerning me. If your heirs take heed to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail you, you, a successor on the throne of Israel. So these are David's. This is David's. David's parting words to his son Solomon. So he's got that in the back of his heads. And then we read this. In 1 Kings 3, 1 through 3, Solomon's king now. Solomon, so, David's passed away. Solomon, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because a temple had not yet been built in the name of the, of the, for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given to him by his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burnt burned incense in on the high places so so right off the bat 
we're seeing the beginnings of Solomon's two, he's a mixed bag. He's got two portraits, the, the, the sinner and the saint. Uh, he loves the Lord. He really does love the Lord. He truly does, just like his father David. Uh, I have this Psalm, Psalm 18, 1 through 2, uh, with, with, with David. I, he, David just comes out and says, it, I love you, O Lord. My strength, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. He's got all these images, David does. And, and I really do think uh, Solomon is a chip off the old block, right? The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And, and Solomon loves the Lord but he made this alliance with, with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And as you know, Israel and, and Egypt have a past, a pretty bad one. And he marries the, the daughter. And he sacrifices these burnt incense on high places, which was, it was frowned upon. I mean, it, God wasn't like outwardly, you know, you should never. But it, it was like this Canaanite practice. But the temple wasn't there yet so it was just this in between time and he's he, he's just he's dabbling in it and it's not the best it's kind of frowned upon like i said but let's keep going verse four then the king solomon went to gibeon to offer sacrifices for that was the most important high place so it's like the so he's going to the the highest high place and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings, okay, on top of that altar. A thousand, that's, that's a lot. And, uh, but again, I, I think his heart's in the right place, though. I really do. I, I can feel for him. The pressure's on. He's king now. He's remembering his dad's words. He doesn't want to screw it up. He wants to do it right. And so, so he's trying to show God he's serious. And then he... he he gets put asleep. He, he's asleep again. So again, sort of reminiscent of, of Adam. Verse 5, At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give to you. Verse 6, Solomon answered, you have, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Here, you, your servant is among the people you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to count. So again, Echoes of Abraham's promise to God's promise to Abraham, Genesis 15, that the nation of Israel would outnumber the stars in the sky and the, the sand. But did he catch it? Solomon sees himself as a child. That there's this sweetness, this innocence about him. He is humbly, truly trying to seek help. He's not proud, he's the opposite of that. Right, and, and he's he is not a child, right? Uh, there, in Israel's history, there's going to be ch child kings. Solomon's not one of them. Commentators think he's around his mid twenties, early twenties, so he's not a, a child per se. But verse nine, hey, here comes the big ask. Verse nine, this is Solomon talking. So, so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to, to, to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? So all of a sudden, it's like Solomon is back at, at the tree, right, of, of, of good and evil. But this time, Solomon says, I, I want God to tell me what is good and not good. I want to follow him. I, I don't want anything but him. I want his wisdom guiding me. I want his understanding leading me. I don't want to lead with whatever just looks good in my own eyes. I know my own eyes are faulty and bad. <laughs> I don't trust them. That's what Solomon's saying. So verse 10. 
the Lord was, was pleased with Solomon that Solomon asked for this. So God said to him, since you've asked for this, and not for the long life or wealth for, for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administrating justice, I will do what you've asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that you will never have, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you did not ask for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. Again, it's amazing to me that this young man asked for the things that, or didn't ask for the things you would normally think of, a genie in a bottle type of thing, right? Fame, riches, a long life, victory over, over his enemies. None of that came to his, his mind. Um, he, he knows he's not enough. He knows it in his bones, and he, he wants help. He, he needs the essential other. He, he's like David in that, where is my help going to come from? My help has got to come from you, Lord. I, I need you. And so he needs wisdom. He needs the fear of the Lord, which we're, gonna, we're definitely going to talk about in the coming weeks. But, but this verse right here reminds me, and maybe it does to you too, reminds me of a verse out of the New Testament. Jesus' fam famous Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is talking to his followers about how they worry about food and clothing. And Jesus tells them this in Matthew 6, 25. It says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body or clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more, much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? <laughs> See how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon, a little hat tip to Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the fields, the flowers, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first what? His kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well, just like he, God did for Solomon, right? God knows what you need. He does. He's, he's, he's not unfamiliar with you and your needs. But he's asking you, is, what is number one in your life? You know, Jesus spoke more about the kingdom of God than anything else in all his teachings. And yet, I think, still, we as Christians, when I say, you know, are you thinking about the kingdom? We're not, we're, ah, what is that? And, and I, I would answer it like, or I would have you think about it like this. Where do you see God at work? In Sydney, in your location, in your home, it, 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 it's, it's not just the church, folks, right? It's, it's outside of the church. It, it's, it is the church, but it's more than the church. But wherever you see that and whatever that is, help fan that into flame. Help serve there. Because that, that is God's... Rain broke in in Sydney, Nebraska. It's not fully here yet, but it's here. It's here. And, and we can be a part of it. And, and again, if, if, you, if you see it and, and you're there and you're, give, and you're serving there, God, God will honor that. Anyway, back to, back to Solomon. 
verse 14. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. And then Solomon awakes and he realizes that it was a dream. He returns to Jerusalem and he stood before the ark of the Lord's covenant and, and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then he gave a feast for all his court because he, he knew something special just happened. God granted Solomon wisdom and so much more. He had wealth and honor and popularity. He had all of it, and, and we'll look at it in the coming months. But I just want to show you in 1 Kings 4, 20 through 25, the people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Again, Genesis, right? They ate, they drank, they were happy and Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. This is the biggest Israel had ever been. I mean, we've never seen Israel this big. These countries brought tribute and were Solomon's subjects all his life. Solomon's daily provisions were 30 cores of the finest flour and 60 cores of meal, 10 head of stall-fed cattle, 20 of pasture-fed cattle, and 100 sheep and goats, as well as deer, gazelles, roebucks, and choice fowl. For he ruled over all the kingdoms west of the Euphrates from Tepsha to Gaza and had peace on all sides. Peace in the Middle East happened. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel from Dan to Beersheba lived in safety Everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. This is, this is Genesis chapter 2 here. Uh, each person under their own fig tree. It's the Garden of Imagery. Images here. Or the Garden of Eden imagery. Things were great for the nation of Israel. There was no wars, no eco economic calamity. It's, it's a picture of Genesis 2. But, you know, there's an old saying that goes, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. That's what matters. And Solomon started well. He really did. Better than most. I think, I think the books we have, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job, are both how to do it right and warnings about how easily the train could get off the tracks easily and how it can go from get real bad really quick. What life could be like under the sun. Because, yeah, Solomon made a great choice in early 20s. He made a good one. But he didn't keep that same fervor, that same attitude. He got proud. He got lazy. He got vulnerable. And... He gave his heart to other things. And, and he was teed up, guys. He was teed up. He knew the truth. He, 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 his dad was, was David, for goodness sakes. And again, he did it right early on when he was 20. But spoiler alert, he did not finish well. But for us today... We who are privileged to have the word of God in our pockets, in our fingertips, in our language. We who know this story well. We who know even more of the story, right? Because we know Jesus. And guess what? Jesus, Matthew chapter 12. Jesus just says this one line that... I didn't notice it until I was studying this week. But Matthew 12, Jesus refers to himself as someone greater than Solomon is here. Someone who knows how to read the river. He knows the river well. He's walked in it. He's been in it. He, he knows the, how to live. He knows the pain of it, the toil of it. Right? We, he, uh, we assume that Jesus' dad, Joseph, died, and, and he, Jesus had to step up to the plate and work and help his mom out all those years at being a carpenter. So he knows how to toil. He knows how to work. And he says to his followers, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross daily 
and follow me. Watch how I do it. This isn't just, hey, again, when you were 20, it's not about that. And it's not about just showing up for an hour once a week. That's not going to cut it. If you want wisdom, if you want to follow me, it's got to be a daily thing. Learn from me. I, follow me. I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. I love you. Pick up your cross and let's go. Because again, it's, again, it's, it's like it's assumed in Genesis 1 and 2 that, that humans, we're just supposed to let God show us what, what's good and evil. And let, let's have Jesus show us what, what's good and what's evil, what's bad. So I want to end, I want to land the plane with Solomon and picture him. I, I want to read some proverb out, out of Proverbs. Picture him as old and gray, and he's learned a thing or two. And it says this out of Solomon, or Proverbs 4, verse 5. And it's just straightforward. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. It, it, it seems like it's attainable to us, right? It's, it's not out of reach. Esteem her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will set a garland of grace on your head. She will present you with a crown of splendor. Listen, my son, accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I will guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. So that's what I want us to dwell on. That do, you, do you know wisdom when you see it? Do you know someone who is wise? Are, are, are you hearing the seriousness of, of his warning? Here is Solomon, an old man, and he's saying, you have to learn to read the river. It, 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 your life won't go well if you don't. And that's what, that's what the book of Proverbs is all about. It's just the basics, how to read the river. And then you get a, the book of Ecclesiastes, and it's, now wait a minute. I know how to read the river, and I'm not getting any, any fish at all. What's up with that? And then you get the book of Job. Hey, I know how to read the river, and everyone I loved died. What's, what's going on there? So there you have it. I, I hope you're excited as I am to dive into these books and, and, and learn more about them. And so, yeah, J July. Let, let's pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for, for these books. J Proverbs. Ecclesiastes and Job, and they're all, they're all necessary, and, and they're all working together. We, we can't, we, we dare not just read them by themselves, Lord. And so God, oh, I, I pray that collectively as we, as we dive into these in, in the future, that, that we would just hear from you and, and, and learn to, Read the river together, God. Um, thank you for wisdom. Thank you that there, there does seem to be this pattern, Lord, woven into the fabric of creation. Um, and, and that w we as humans can get there, Lord, Lord, with your help and, and with your leading and guiding. W w again, w when you're... When you're number one, we can get there. And so, Lord, help us. Help us, help us. 
And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask and imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Mm -hmm.